From Philadelphia, the city that pulsates with the beat and the rhythms of yesterday and today, it's time for the Geeter with the Heater, the boss with the hot sauce, Jerry Blavitt. 60 seconds make one minute, 60 minutes make one hour, 24 hours make one day, and out of that 24 hours, two and a half hours are dedicated by the young teenager to the hip fish show on the radio. So without further ado, let's carry on through now. Five, four, three. Two, one, blast off! Yon teenager gather round. Ha ha! To the sound I'm a putting back. Come on, baby, let the good time roll. Come on, baby, let me thrill your soul. Come on, baby, let the good time roll. Roll on and long. Well, you and I are together again. This is going to be a very special show. Philadelphia, for generation after generation, going back to the 40s and the 50s, the 60s and the 70s, has been truly the sound that everyone talks about. I go back when I was a kid, it was Nat Sigel, Bernie Lowenthal, and a record company called Sound and Team. And they had Gloria Mann, and they had Freddie Bell and the Bell Boys, and they had Sandy Stewart. And then in the latter part of the 50s, when Dick Clark took over Bandstand, Sound and Team became known as Cameo and Parkway Records with Bobby Rydell, Chubby Checker, the Dobells, Dee Dee Sharp. That was the sound of Philadelphia at that time. We're talking about, let's say, from 1956 to around 1964, 65. At that time, there was a young man who had a record store on South Street. And he was singing with a group of guys called the Romeos. His name was Kenny Gamble. Kenny Gamble also was writing songs with a fellow by the name of Jerry Ross with a group that you might remember called the Sapphires. Another young man by the name of Leon Huff from Camden was also writing things. Together on the Cameo Parkway record label, they did a song called The 81, mm. which you remember by Candy and the Kisses. Well, these two young men, Leon Huff and Kenny Gamble took the sound of the 40s, the 50s, and the 60s and created, which is internationally known as the sound of Philadelphia. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure to present the innovator, the creator, the man that had the vision from the 50s into the 60s, the 70s to create the sound of Philadelphia. He's my main man, Kenny Gamble. <laughs> wow. That was beautiful, Jerry. It really was. <laughs> I say, it, it made me go back, you know, and and think all those errors, you know. It's just so much. And, and, and look, you've been there since the beginning, you know, since you was down on in South Philly. Both of us is from South Philly, so you know, when I look at you, it makes me think of the day I was walking down that, that street. What was the name of that street, Jerry? Mifflin Street in South Philadelphia. Mifflin. <laughs> and, and I came up to your house, and uh, that was it. From that, that day on, I was down in your house all just about every day. Kenny, did you ever think back then, what you were writing with Jerry Ross back then with the Sapphires, right? Right. Yeah, the Sapphires. Um, yeah, that was good. Who do you love? You know, That's the one you love. And that was on the Swan recording label. Swan Records. Yeah, that you was never, on Swan. But did you ever think back then, and then you hooked up with Huff, that this sound that you created would be internationally what is known all over the world? See, you got to understand. When Dick Clark had bandstand, as you and I know, it was Cameo Parkway. That That's was right. the dance sound, if you remember. 
And yeah. you know, the eighty one that you and and Ken, you and and actually Huff did. No, we had Huff wrote the eighty one. Yeah. Right, right. And it was a takeoff on the song called no, In no, My no, Lonely no, Room. Jerry, no, I'm sorry. I'm very sorry. It was me and Jerry Ross that wrote the eighty one. Uh-huh. With Candy and the Kisses. Let me get it right. right. That's what it was. And and Huff was working with Johnny Madeira and Dave White. And Lynn Barry, God bless him. I just heard he, he passed away not long ago. But Lynn Barry, Bonnie Sigler, and all these guys, was they were working together with Johnny Madeira and Dave White, who was part of the guys to... Uh, Danny and the Juniors. Danny and the Juniors. There you yeah. go. Yeah. At the hop. At the hop. There you go. At the, that hop. Was, At the hop. That was a monster. Yeah. yeah. But did you ever think back then that the sound that you created will be what it is today. I had no idea, no idea. And I'm, I'm, I'm so thankful because all of us, you know, we, we all worked close together. And, and I think like, um, I think when, when Bandstand moved to California, mm -hmm. it, a, a hole opened up, you know what I mean? Because you had your show, I, I was on, me, me and Huff was on your show. You had a show like, uh, yeah, like Bandstand. Yeah, yeah, sure. And uh, and I never thought that 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 it would uh, grow to these proportions, Jerry. You know, and uh, and it's really a blessing because you know when you're writing songs and you're producing records, you do it from your heart. You know, me and my wife were just listening to the Intruders. You know, and was get, I was getting in the mood, man. I was getting in the mood for the Gator. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but so. you know, you talk about the intruders come home soon. Oh man, when that's something. Listen, but I'm going back with you with a cat by the name of Benny Crass. Benny Crass Brothers. Crass Brothers, my man. Now, let me tell you for the people out there watching, Benny Crass had a store in South Philadelphia on South Street called the Store of the Stars, and Curtis Mayfield would go there, and when Sammy Davis was in town. He, everybody would go there to get their clothing because he had the sharp clothes. Oh, yeah. And he loved Kenny Gamble. Did he put up the seed money originally for you to get into the recording industry? Benny Crass, let me tell you this, man. Benny Crass, my mother used to take me and my brothers down there to get, get our clothes. <laughs> and Benny, Benny Crass, one day we was down there, my mother Ruby and uh, my brother Charles and my brother Carl, and uh, I was singing or something. I was little. I was a little guy. And then Ben said, man, send him down here, Ruby, so that, so that you know, we could teach him or whatever. So through the years, I got older and older and older. And then one day I went into Crash Brothers. I said, Benny, I said, uh, so I got some songs. He said, you writing songs? I said, yeah, I'm writing songs. He said, well, look, you, you're uh, Roland Chambers. I don't know if you remember Roland Chambers. Roland Chambers was the guitar player. Yeah. You know, work yeah. with us. So he said, well, bring, bring, uh, bring your band over and, and let me hear you, how, how you guys sound. So Benny was living at the, the Philadelphian apartments over there. So I took my band over there, took Roland, took uh, uh, his brother Carl, and uh, um, one other guy, Winnie Wilfred. We went over there, and Benny had a song that he wanted to do for Curtis Mayfield. You was right about that. And uh, the name of the song was called Man Oh Man. Man Oh Man, I've traveled yeah. around the world. Yeah, right. And you know, Curtis also did that song. He recorded it himself. Yeah. Curtis, yeah. So what happened was, is that uh, we, we went in the studio and so Benny said, look, I want you guys to rehearse me and everything. He said, so Benny said, what can I do for you? I said, well, I said, we got some songs. We want to record them in the studio, you know? And so Benny said, okay, I'll pay for it. How much is this? I think it was like about $1,200 or something like that. Mm -hmm. So Benny gave us the $1,200 to get started. And then, then Benny said, uh, uh, he said, what, what do you got? What else you guys got? You know what I mean? And so, so I, I, I told him, I said, look, we got a group. They call the Intruders, you know? So Benny, Benny Crass and then I told Ben, I said, Benny, we need somebody to help uh, promote the records and whatever. So Bishop, you and all of us, I mean, all of us was, was clack. This, this city was, was tight and, 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 and beautiful, sky lit. Everybody was helping everybody. And so 
So the key of it was is that we got Cal Rudman. Yeah. Who, who had the who had quarterback, yeah, the quarterback music sheet. But this was then. way before the quarterback game. This was when he was the yeah. a writer for Record World. Yep. See, because Rudman Rudman had 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 the had the ear of the whole record community. Yeah. And so I mean, look, man, it could, we could go, we could go on and on and on and on. Kenny, so, you know, but it's so interesting because the first thing that the first real group, ladies and gentlemen, were the intruders for Kenny Gamble, exactly. Little Sonny, Big Sonny, Phil Terry, and I go back with each day of the night. Come yeah. home soon, come, from come home soon together. And do you remember, Ken, when I did the thrill show? If you remember at the stadium, 90,000 people, and I put the intruders on with me. As a matter of fact, Bob Hope <laughs> at that time was the MC. Mm -hmm. And man, that was just, the, I'm going back, I'm going back 63, 64, Ken. Wow. <laughs> that's, that's a long time, man. But you know, we're we blessed to still be here. And uh, we were talking. Me and my wife were just talking about the intruders and how long, how long ago it was that. Because because the intruders, I loved them when I was in high school, and then when me and I was working with Jerry Ross, mm -hmm. Huff was Huff was then working for Johnny Madera. Yep, all of them guys. And believe it, one day I walked into uh, Huff's office at the uh, Schubert Building, and he was rehearsing the intruders. So when I said, I said, wow, that's my favorite group. So me and Huff started writing some, and Leroy Lovett was in there. That, that yes, day. Leroy. He was working with Huff. And, um, and man, listen, we started messing around with some songs. So we wrote that song, uh, I'm Going to Be Strong, you know, see? And then um, we, we, I, I used to love the little Sonny's voice because he had such a unique voice, you know? And... Uh, and then we messed around and messed around and kept said, we got to write something different for him. And we messed around and came up with Cowboys to Girls. Yeah. But now, how does this association with you and Leon evolve into the sound of Philadelphia, Philadelphia International? First, it was the Gamble label, as you know, and then it was... That was Rudman, you know, that wanted that. He said, yeah, he said, you got Motown and Barry Gordy said... So let's let's do a, a gamble records with Philly and whatever. Mm -hmm. I said, well, well, you changed because, as we had said at the beginning of this program, the Philly sound was Camelio Parkway, Bob Horn, Dick Clark, Swan, Chancellor. Then comes in Kenny. Then comes in writing team Kenny, Jerry Ross, and then comes Huff and Kenny. And now it is the beginning. The first group, the Intruders. Tell me about the second group where we get Gamble. How's that start now? Well, Jerry Ross was in the Schubert building. And he, that's how we really got our, our beginning because Jerry was doing great. He had produced uh, Apple Peaches, Pumpkin Pie. Dave techniques, yeah, the, yeah. The dream, the dream uh, Lovers. Yep. Uh, with um, uh, Donnie Larry. Yeah, when we get married, a great, great one, all of that, okay? And then Jerry, he made a deal up in New York, and he left and went to New York. Uh -huh. And so he said, look, he said, if you want the office, you you know, here's the keys. So he gave me the keys to the office at the Schubert building, and I and I put it, you know, he, he signed it over to me. So I, now we had an office. Huff was still working for Johnny Madera, mm -hmm. and then they were down, like, on the second floor. Right. Jerry played uh, his... Uh, Office was on the sixth floor. And so, so Huff decided to come on upstairs with me. So me and I was writing together and, and 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 we were writing just so easy. It was so easy for us to write together. It was beautiful, you know. And so um that's when Gamble and Huff came in because Huff was actually really working for uh um for Johnny Madera and all those guys. And so I think when he he's, he got out of that agreement with them and came. Me and him came together to uh, to write together and start our company. We started our uh, Gamble Hub Productions, and um, 
And that was that was the beginning right there. And you had you had all of those groups, you had all of those people. And when when we finally opened up our our, our office, we had people from all over Philly. It was unbelievable. The you know? first group that hit pay dirt for gambling up on Philly International. What group was that? Philly International. I would think that uh, the Ebony's. Yeah, it's uh, from Camden. From Camden, yeah. Yes. Yeah, Huff, Huff said, they said, man, you, we should look, listen to this group from Camden called the Ebony's. And so me and Huff listened to them. I said, they sound great. I mean, they had a great tenor. They had a great, I mean, it was, that was a great group, still a great group, to be honest with you. How did, how did Harold Melvin and the Blue Notes, because you know, you and I go back with them, man, when they did, if you love me, if my hero way oh, back yeah, in the yeah. 50s, man. All right, let's, let's go back, let's go back to, with Harold Melvin. You're talking about in the, in the, in the 50s. Yep. The mid 50s, all right, that's when I became, and they used to turn the uptown out. I mean, uh, Harold mm -hmm. Melvin and the Blue Notes. And, um, and what happened with Harold Melvin and the Blue Notes is that they, um, they were very, very popular around here in Philadelphia and on the East Coast at the Apollo, places like that. Mm -hmm. And so when Harold, they broke up, in fact, I think uh, one or two of them had passed away and then, then Harold was the Blue Notes and we had Philly International. And so the Blue Notes, Harold and Bunny Sigler and Herb Ward and all these guys, they used to come see us perform as the Romeos. Yeah. They used to come see us perform over at the uh, the Hi Hat in Jersey, <laughs> and, and so we would it would be jam packed the Hi Hat, and so you had um, you had all of the local acts that they would come there like on Sundays, and whoever was playing at the Uptown was Smokey and the Miracles, and all them guys would come over to the Hi Hat, and we had the greatest band in the world, you know, with the Romeos, the Romeos you couldn't you couldn't find a better band, and. Um, and once and once we we get the joint jumping, everybody would be singing, you know. And so Loretta Loretta would be making that fried chicken and fried. Yeah, fish. Loretta's hi hat, Lawnside. Loretta's hi hat. We'd be rolling, <laughs> <laughs> Lawnside, New Jersey, and uh, and so that's how that was like a a a, a place where people would come and audition. I I tell you, who was really great with Bunny Sigler. Yeah, people we used to love Bunny because he's a great entertainer, you know. You know, and one of the unsung heroes of our business, man. Oh, yeah. I mean, Bunny, other than let the good times roll and feel so good, you yeah. know. But then when he went with Philly International, you really right. used him writing and arranging, and you yeah. really brought him out. Yeah, well, Huff, Huff was working with him too. You know, he worked with him when they was down there with Johnny Madera and them because. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. That feels so good, and uh, yes, and all those times go. Yeah. He, he he recorded those down there with Johnny Madera. But when he came up and worked with us uh, at Gamble Huff, I, I had mentioned to him, I said, "Bunny, you know, we done made a couple records with you already." You know what I mean? I said, "And and you sound as good or better than all of these guys." I mean, because he was a great singer. He sounded a little bit like Sam Cooke. Yep, and um. And so I said, well, let's try you write being a songwriter. You know, let's see what happens. Because really, that's what he wanted to do, really, because songwriting is something that goes on forever and ever and ever. It goes on, you know. So, mm -hmm. so we, we were able to, to, um, to a couple of acts, like McFadden and Whitehead. They had, they had a, they were, uh, they were singer, they were singers too. They wanted to be, uh, what was the name of their group? The Talk of the Town. Yes, but they were they were great songwriters though. Great songwriters. Yes. And and but that was a process because Huff and I we would listen to them and say, "Wow, they sound good," but they write songs better than they sound, mm -hmm. and they sing. You know what I mean? That's just like me. I remember I've made records for Columbia, for Atlantic, yeah. made all them records and whatever. I really, I didn't, I really didn't like performing you know, that much because you got to get up on the stage and you got to do the split and you got to do this. <laughs> but, but I mean, and that wasn't my thing, you know what I mean? <laughs> so so the, the the beautiful part of it was is that we were able to switch from being entertainers mm -hmm. and be producers and be able to bring out talent in people. You know, I, I want to bring something up to the audience, Kenny. 
when you guys really started to click, you bought the old Cameo Parkway Studios at Broad and Spruce. You brought in the spruce, that's true. And across the street was the bar. Remember the bar across the street? That's L Loretta's fan fantasy, <laughs> the fantasy lounge. So I used to ask Loretta, hey, hey Gita, here's what I used to say. I said, Loretta, I said, why would you name this here uh, the fantasy? Loretta said, because that's what it is. She said, it's a fantasy. And I said, all right. The fantasy, so, <laughs> the fantasy lounge. Hey, that fantasy lounge used to be packed. Man. That, so, you never know who you're going to see there. You might you so, might walk in the door. You'd be recording everybody. I knew the bell would come into the fantasy lounge. Oh, yeah. Everybody. Lou Rawls would be coming. Everybody. Those days, all of them was there. They but, come in to get their, their chicken and their fish. <laughs> That's what they were doing, dude. Go ahead. Kenny, first group for Philly International. What was the first? Other than the intruders. Well, it was the, it was the Ebony's. Ebenezer, but after, I know he, but the first big group, was it Harold Melvin? Harold Melvin and the, and the Blue Notes. The OJs? The OJs in uh, uh, Three Degrees. Three Degrees with R Rich Richard Barrett. Richard Barrett, another great, great creative person. Let me explain to the people out there who Richard Barrett was. Richard right. Barrett sang with a group called the Valentines. Lily Maybell, the Woo Woo Train. He became the A&R director for Morris Levy Roulette Records and was instrumental in finding Little Anthony, Frankie Lyman, but his big group were the Chantels. Chantel. And, and the Three Degrees basically became what the Chantels were in the 60s and 70s with you, right? That's right. Three Degrees were, were and Richard Bragg was, was a great combination for us. And... Uh, and so when we recorded the Three Degrees, we uh, we we put a new twist to them, like you know what I mean, to the Three Degrees. Because Richard, he he had been recording them for years for Swan Records. Yep. And then because um, the Three Degrees was an excellent, and I'll say an excellent group, especially for performances. You know, they used to perform for. The, the queen, the princesses, and everything overseas, they, they were really a classy act. Listen, did you ever use them in backup in the studio? Because when you were doing that sound, that oh, yeah. Philadelphia International sound, man. Yeah, hey, listen, the Three Degrees did a lot of our background work. They did the background on uh, on TSOP, the Sound of Philadelphia, with MFSP. Uh, that was the, the big one we had with them. And then we did a record with them by themselves, uh, we wrote a song called "When Will I See You Again," yeah. and that was uh, that was a big record for the Three Degrees. You know? I got to tell you, the OJ's version of that man with Eddie singing lead. When will I see you again? Yeah, I mean, how did you snag the OJ's who came out of Cleveland? How did you do that? Well, you know, there was a guy named Ed Wright who was uh, a disc jockey in Cleveland. Eddie O'Day. Ed Wright and Ed Wright said to us, he said, "Listen, man. He said I got I'm managing the OJ's. Him and a, a, was a disc jockey up there. His name was Eddie OJ. Yep. So when we used to go around and promote our records, we went by there and we met the OJ's and and uh, we said we got, we told him we were going to write something for him because the OJ's were like the intruders to me when they used to come to Philly." This was a group that I said, wow. I said, they really do have a unique sound. Eddie Levert, he, yep. there's no voice like Eddie Levert's voice. All right. So in working with the OJs, we had the, the OJs. We had the, uh, Hal Melvin and the Blue Nose. We had the you Blue got the Nose. three degrees, you got the Ebony's. Three degrees, the Ebony's. And uh, it'll come to me. It was so many of them. It was, uh, it was unbelievable. And, and they really just needed, they were great voices. They just needed great songs. And, and that's what we specialize in with songs. Okay, but now let me ask you this question. Whose idea, this is truly the sound of Philadelphia, to go into the studio, how many pieces were you using to back these artists up? Oh, well, it, our orchestra, which was MFSB. Yes. Uh, all right. Our orchestra was composed of maybe 
maybe about 30 pieces. It's like an orchestra. See, that was the true sound of Philadelphia. Yeah. Oh, exactly. That, that's what it was. We had a small studio, though. Our studio was small, but the, the, um, the recording process had changed. Joe Tarja was, he was a genius, you understand? Sigma Sound. Yeah, Sigma Sound Studios was all part of it. Was, it was great teamwork. What we were doing, we had a team, and once and once that team got together, man, you can't you can't beat it. You couldn't man, beat it. You See? had it after it. You know, I got to tell them the story about Lou Rawls. You Go know, ahead. Lou was a dear friend of ours, as you know. You know, you and I were together when the Latin Casino changed to became a disco. If you remember, right. yeah, I remember. We were that. at the cocktail party when wow. they changed from the Latin to Emerald City. I and Lou that. was there, if you remember. Yeah. And Lou said to me, you know, Gita, I don't have a contract with Kapler anymore. And you wind up signing him. Is that right? Ain't that something? Hey, look, you know, we all, man, Huff was always on the prowl, you know that. And, yeah. and there's another guy, Lou Rawls, who has such a unique voice. See, when I get there, you'll See, never find. <laughs> you'll never find. That was the first one. That That was a good one, you know. Because we, we were good at being able to, to uh, tailor make songs for for artists, you know. And then the other one that, that we, we're letting slip by was the Soul Survivors. Well, let's talk about the that. Best way, because you <laughs> was involved in that, Gita. You and Nat Sigal, you know, wow. <laughs> God bless Nat. I mean, he, he, he was he, he's a good businessman, right? Man, let me tell you. When Dick Clark left Philadelphia, folks, Dick Clark said to me, I used to have a club every month where all of the record guys would get together. He said, I had just bought a big home. I was doing big with the discophonic TV scene. So we would invite everybody over on a Tuesday night. We'd have food. We'd shoot pool. And we'd all get together. The record guys, Maddie Singer, Nat right. Sigal, Jerry Ross, and a guy by the, 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 guy by the name at, at this point, uh, and you, re you remember him. He, he, he was a dancer. He used to be with Ray and Essie at the RVA club. OK. And you came over. You were one of the guests. And they talked about this group that was located at 13th and Locust. Remember, that's where they were playing. 13th and Locust. Well, you want to see them. And that was the beginning of the Soul Survivors. They were great. You remember that? I, I remember. Them. I was listening to some of their music the other day. And and they were singing. Um, who were they singing? They were singing uh, one of James Brown's songs. Man, they sound. I, feel, I feel good. They used to do. I feel good. Yeah, and all, yeah. I love them, man. Richie and Charlie, man. You know. Richie and uh, Charlie. That's what. 1967, right? Seven. That was 67. 1967. Right. And that was really the number one song around the world. That's you right. know, and on the CD, which is a salute to the Philly International Sound, that's the lead-off song on on the compilation things that you had, and right. that really set you up. That 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 that, that really was the Soul Survivors, man. Soul Survivors, man. Them guys was great, man. I remember that they. I remember they they performed that time, and man, they used to get up on the stage, man. They break up, break open a, a guitar <laughs> and all that. They, they, get the register, throw the money out. To them. Yeah, that was great. Man. <laughs> well, now let's talk about this. We talked about Lou. We talked about the OJs. We talked about Harold. Let's talk about Patty the Bell because you and I go back with Patty when she was recording for Harold. Well, well I don't know how um, Harold Robinson. Harold Robinson. There you Actually, go. He was the automobile dealer. You know, your life has come from a clothing guy to an automobile dealer. Automobile salesman. <laughs> yeah, Harold did, Robinson. That's right. Best way. That's Bobby Martin, man. See, you you, you got a cast of characters here. That, that's <laughs> unbelievable. These these are all great people. Everybody had their little role that they played. You know what I mean in this thing. Because uh, I sold my heart to the junk man. That was how I'll be Robinson and the Bluebells. Right. And Newtown Records. That was his record label. Newtown, yeah. if you remember that. Yeah. Well, so, how did, and, how and, did you and, snag like Patty to record with you? Well, you know, I went to school with Patty. Uh huh. In, in West Philly. And uh, she's, we, I knew her long before, before she started recording because 
we should, I should go over to her house. I, I knew some friends of hers that live right across the street from her in West Philly. Mm -hmm. So I used to go over there and see her and listen to her sing. I used to tell her, I said, I said Patty, she started singing, man. The whole neighborhood would come out, man, when Patty started singing, you know. And so now we had our record company and, and uh and Patty was singing and she and, and she had um a manager, his name was Montague. Little Montague. I love little Montague. Yeah, little Montague. You remember all these people? How, how these all these names keep popping up in your <laughs> head. Montague. Montague, he used he used to make posters, you know what I mean? Uh and Montague, during the time, I was I was promoting shows. I was promoting shows, and Montague used to do all my posters for me. <laughs> Patty LaBelle, we, we used to go to the place up on 60th and uh, Spruce and give uh, give those those dances and stuff. And because uh, Philly was it it, it it it'll never be the same again. Because again, listen, you had I remember when you used to have two three dances in one night. Well, you had <laughs> kids. I know. I mean, it's great. You know. You, you know, Kenny. I remember, and this is something the audience may not know. When you started the record company, Pillar International, originally, you went to Atlantic Records for them That's to make true. a deal, right? That's true. And they they turned it down, and that's. That was the biggest mistake that they ever made <laughs> yeah. at that time. How did you, know, you wind up? How did you wind up with the deal with Columbia, with Clive well, Davis? You know, yeah, when I recorded, you know, I was I was on Columbia Records. So I, I had known these people, and uh, I tell you, another guy who who played a role with us too was uh, Larry Maggot. Yeah, Larry Maggot helped us out a lot, and uh, and and Jimmy Bishop. Jimmy Bishop was, boy, he he helped us out a, a lot because he he was uh, he was probably the number one DJ in this town when 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 the industry started to really put itself get itself together. Bishop was was the program director over there at WDAS, right? And uh, and the industry no nowhere near like today like it was then, you yeah. know. There no more. There no more disc jockeys today, Ken. As no, you that's know, over. Yeah, back that's then, over. you know, you were coming to you were coming to my home when I was doing the radio show, so and you think either listen to the song. That's I right. put it right on the turntable. Right, and then two so, three days we'd have a smash, man. The Gita, I'm gonna play it one more time for you. <laughs> I love it, man. You know, it'll never be. It'll never be that good again. No, it's gonna be all, better. You know, I'll just all say the great that. Jock jockeys, Jocko. George uh, Woods, Bishop, hey. Lord Fauntleroy, John Bandy, if you remember. Oh, man. <laughs> how, how about the morning with the sheriff, Lloyd Fatman? Lloyd Fatman. <laughs> Ain't that something? Lloyd Fatman. These are all good people, man. You know, and, and I'm glad that they, um, I'm glad that we, we're here to, to just call their name out, you know what I mean, to, to give them credit. Because as soon as they hear us talking about them, they might they might be gone in in the flesh, but in the spirit, it's wonderful, you know. Well, you know, Kenny, you got to be so fulfilled because the music that you did changed the way the industry was. And then Marvin Gaye, who dear old friend of ours, when he did the album "What's Going On," oh yeah, yeah. which was a social comment at that time. And you know when Sam Cooke did a change is going to come right. at that time, there was a social comment when you did "Wake Up Everybody" mm. and the songs that you started to do, which carried what Marvin was doing at the very beginning and Sam was doing at the very beginning. You were the voice of the people back then, yeah, because of the music. Yeah, the music. The music was able to say what a lot of people was thinking, you know, and, um, you know, songs like I'll always love my mama. And, and, you know, the, the, the one thing that, that I look at Jerry is that it was a, it was a team of us. It was, it wasn't just one person or two people. It was a group of us working together, mm -hmm. you know, and, uh, and it came out that, uh, McFadden and Whitehead, Leon Huff, Tom Bell, Tommy Bell and Linda Creed was a great yeah. team together. 
Before we do leave, though, Ken, you got to be fulfilled, you and us, mm -hmm. for changing the course of where rock and roll was from the 50s, the 60s, from Philly Sound, the Jersey Sound, to Philly International. I mean, yeah. that's got to be so fulfilling for you in your lifetime. Did you ever think, beginning with the Romeos, beginning writing with, with Jerry Ross, with Huff, that this would take you to where you are today? Never dreamed it. Never dreamed it. I always hoped for it and wished for it to, and hope that there'll even be more today because the music is the one thing that, that keeps, that makes me feel good. I, I, I feel good when I listen to music, you know? And so uh, when I listen to those songs, sometimes I, I wonder, I say to myself, I say, how in the world did we come up with all of that stuff, you know? Because it's, um, you know, Love is Like a Baseball Game and all them songs, you know, they, they were so much fun and, uh, yeah. And it made, it made people feel good. You know, we all felt good singing those songs and making those records. So, well, uh, I got to ask you about Teddy Pendergrass, if you recall. Yes. Teddy originally was a drummer, if you remember, with Tavares. Because Butch said to me he used to be a drummer for them. And it's interesting for the people out there watching because Lola Falana was married to Butch up to Varys before she became doing a dance thing with Sammy Davis. But right. how did Teddy get involved with Harold Melvin at that time? Well, Harold Melvin was a genius when putting these groups together. He'd been doing it since we discussed earlier, since in the 50s, because Harold was, he was, he was the youngest Blue Note uh, of them all. But how Melvin was a great uh, coordinator. He'd take a group and, and put them into routines and so forth and whatever. So how put this new group, the Blue Notes, together. Mm -hmm. and he had Larry, he had Lloyd, he had Teddy. Bernie Williams, Bernie. Bernie, yeah, big Bernie. Yeah, Bernie. Yeah. <laughs> and, 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 they, and they sound good. And they used to come over to the hi-hat. They used to... We all used to work together. And then uh, as time went on, Hal, Hal wanted us to record them, you know? And I told Hal, I said, I said, Hal, I think you need to get a um, another lead singer because Hal had a good voice, but he, his voice was soft, you know what I mean? And at that time you was competing with people like the Dells, mm -hmm. and competing with people, I mean, you, you, you're talking about these monster singers, you know? And so how Melvin was, uh, uh, he, he had a nice smooth voice and so forth, whatever. And then I think how found Teddy Pendergrass. Who was him, a drummer. Put him in his group. He put him in the group, the Blue Notes. And so Huff called me one day and said, Gamble, he said, man, how got a group down here and he got a guy with him. He said, you got to hear him. So that guy was Teddy Pendergrass. And so by the time I got down there, they was they was uh, running by songs and everything. And and when I heard him, I said, wow, I said, this guy is uh, he's unique. He's unique. And so we were able to uh, to make a deal with Hal Melvin uh, with the Blue Notes and the song. Um, we were working on was I Miss You. Miss You, Miss I, You, I remember, great, great song. Great one, yeah, and um, and when I, and, and, and I Miss You was, was, uh, was unbelievable, it really was. And, and the funny part of it was, after that, we had songs like, uh, If You Don't Know Me By Now, yeah. And and that was during the time when we were connected to CBS Records, mm -hmm. Columbia Records. They were our distributor because that's when we created Philadelphia International Records. And um, and once 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 you started to get records, because the record business had changed again then, because uh, it wasn't like the old days. You didn't have Sid Williams, and you didn't have uh, uh, the uh, um, 
the one stops and all that stuff. This stuff had changed tremendously. You know what you did, Ken, which I, I just came to my mind. Rule of thumb in the record business is that a record could not be more than two minutes, 50 seconds long. That's true. Your records were, were four longer. minutes, five minutes, oh, yeah, six yeah. minutes, and they were played on FM radio first because AM, if you remember, was yes. limited because of commercials that they wanted to throw in. Oh, FM yeah. radio really created. There you go. See, what, what we did, see, this, the new format to radio came in, which was FM radio, because yes. we had songs we had songs that was like 11 minutes long, you know, like Be For Real with Al Melvin and the Blue Notes. That was Love a, I Lost, man, was eight minutes. Long, that was, yeah, 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 that was a long, yeah, that was, that was one of them dance joints, <laughs> man. Are you kidding that they used to see that's when disco came in. See, now talking about that, tell me about Soul Train. Now, for the people out there, when Soul Train hit, man, that was the hippest dance show in the world. No disrespect for my buddy Dick Clark, all those yeah. dance shows. My show was, was hip too, but I wasn't around on my show when Soul Train. How did you come up? Did, well, did you come now, up with the theme? Let me tell you what happened now, Don Cornelius. Who was a disc jockey? Oh, he was a disc jockey in Chicago. Yes. And he had Soul Train. Um, and it just it just bust wide open. Soul Train just busted wide open. And uh you you remember Mitch Thomas, right? Oh, to promise Alla Mr. Thomas, Alla Wilmington, Delaware, then on WDAS, and had the first black band show, if you remember, on That's Channel 12, going back into the 50s, man. Wonderful, man. And you know, so. So the thing of it is, is that you had, um, you had Mitch Thomas, you had Soul Train, you had all of these different, Georgia Woods even had a show. You had a show. I was, hey, we could get them tapes back that we did on, <laughs> on, on your show. Boy, what, what a treasure that would be. I think that's probably the only performance that uh, the Romeos and I, we did on your did show. Did my show. Did your did show. Did my show. You know. So I gotta thank you again for that. See, that's, that's how you've been in, in and out, in and out of our lives. We've been yeah, working we've been together. So did did you? Because that theme for Soul Train just set off the whole pace of the whole show. That's the that's the one that the Three Degrees was on. Yes, too. indeed. And and yes. you know, hey, 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 Jerry, the other thing was is that Don Cornelius was he was good people. He used to come in. And uh, we sit down and talk, and and uh, he'd use all, all of our artists, all of our artists. He would call me and say, "Okay, who we got this week?" I said, "Hey, man, take the intruders in, put them in there, you know, put a uh, 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 Teddy Pendergrass." And he he would use all of our artists. And, so and now that, tell me about Billy Paul. Oh, Billy, Billy Paul! Billy was a jazz singer originally, as jazz. you know. And he, I love Billy Paul, man, and his wife Blanche. Blanche, hey, listen, Billy Paul, he got his big, he was from South Philly, too. So, yep. so you got to look at Billy when he was working at a club in South Philly on 15th and South. It was called the Sahara Hotel. <laughs> on South Street. And it wasn't a big place, but it was, it, it was the place to be, like, on a Sunday, you know. Mm -hmm. The thing of it was is that Billy was such a unique Voice and and that's what we we look for. We look for how unique is the is the, the artist's voice. And Billy Paul, there's nobody that sounds like Billy Paul. And so Billy had had a record. My my record shop was on uh, Broad and South, right on the uh, on the corner of Broad and South. Mm -hmm. and Billy had a store around 15th and South where he sold all kinds of garments and stuff like that, whatever. So me and Billy used to talk every day. And then uh, uh, I was telling Billy, I said, hey, Billy, I said, I'm working with Benny Crash. You know, I could, might be able to put your, your album out. And so me and Billy went to talk to Benny. This was our first album that Billy had. He had cut part of it himself. And uh, we put that album out. And, and he had songs like On a Clear Day. He had all these jazz songs, you know what I mean? And then uh, as time went on, me and Huff started working with him. 
me and Huff, we 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 uh we came up with that song, me and Mrs. Jones. Tell me how that happened. How did that song come out? That song was a uh, uh, it, it was unbelievable. How I would because uh, Huff and I we used to write every day, you know, just about. Mm -hmm. And by us writing every day, we would come up with a lot of great songs. And that song, and the way we would come up with songs is by watching people. You watch people and you, you see what they're doing. And so me and Mrs. Jones was, well, there was there used to be a little bar on um, where the Schubert Theater was at. There was a little bar there called Boots Bar. And Huff and I used to go down there every day take a break from writing or whatever we go down there and sit down in boots and get a beer or whatever the case might be and so we might say hey hey up it's the same guy again that old guy looked like like an older guy with a younger woman see <laughs> you know, see we we, we used to laugh and stuff like that you know we we have, have a ball listen yeah. that ain't changed you know <laughs> Oh, yeah, that's, that's still going on, you know. So anyway, it could have it could have been his daughter, it could have been his niece, could have been anybody. But we created it the, the thing that this was his girlfriend. Grammy Song of the Year, every yeah. award. I mean, amazing. It's By great. the way, that also was six minutes long when I had the original. Oh, yeah, that was the long one there. That was because and then and then once we started working on that Joker. Man, listen, Billy Paul, man, his voice was so unique, so unique. And the story, it's the stories that's in those songs. Those songs you know, that... Ken, one of my favorite songs that you did, you originally did for Jerry Butler, that hmm. Billy Dill did it. It's called Only the Strong Survive, man. Only the Strong Survive. Hey, Milk, me and Huff, we, we, we were recording Jerry Butler. And Jerry Butler... We wrote some great songs with Jerry Butler. Me and Huff uh, wrote uh, Only the Strong Survive with Jerry Butler. We wrote Hey Western Union Man with Jerry Butler. And my favorite out of all of them was Never Gonna Give You Up. Oh, man. Oh, wow. Is that a great... Jerry Butler was the ice man. Are you kidding? He's a monster, you know? And Georgie Woods, he gave people names that stick with them until the day. <laughs> the, ice man. the ice man. He just stood up there and just sang. Said he's as cool as ice. <laughs> he's so cool. It's the ice man, and uh, uh, and uh, and then with Jerry Butler came came a, a new era because I learned a lot from Jerry Butler as a as a as a songwriter. Mm -hmm. I used to watch him, you know, and uh, so in the press impression like Curtis Mayfield. Oh, Curtis, Curtis Mayfield was a was a monster. You know? Listen, Curtis Mayfield is one of the unsung heroes in our industry. Curtis yeah. not only wrote like Kenny and Leon, he also produced, he played on his, and he created the true sound, I think, Kenny of Chicago. Right. When you talk about it's Curtis's sound with Major Lanch, with Jerry Butler back then, you know, I mean, that was the sound, the artistic. Yeah. What Curtis Mayfield did, because I used to ask Roland this all the time. He reinvented the guitar, how to play the, the guitar. Curtis Mayfield, he had a, um, I think, I think the standard way of playing the guitar, I think it's called vesipool. Mm -hmm. And that, that's when, you know, you have this, the, the high strings at the bottom and, and the bass up at the top. Curtis Mayfield reversed that and started playing it, man. And look, it became, you could tell us. All you got to do is turn on an impression record. And you could hear it's Curtis Mayfield. That guitar is different. What? It's that's different. the same thing with Philly International. You oh, can yeah. turn radio on, man, and you, this guy, don't even have to tell you, it is the sound of Philadelphia. Tell me about those wonderful musicians. We talked about you doing 30 pieces in the studio. Who were some of those cats that were playing with you? Well, you had uh, Roland Chambers, who is uh, who was great, Roland Chambers, you know. Me and Roland, we went to West Philly High School together, and we used to walk walk home together, him playing the guitar, you know, and we sitting down playing that guitar, and Roland taught me how to play the guitar, to be honest with you. You know, yeah. he, he was my, 
when I did my TV show, he was at the house band. He was my house band. Roland Chambers, yeah, Roland Chambers. Royce Rages, Royce Rages, Royce Vince Rages. Montana. Vince Montana, good man. And, and, and Buddy Savitt, who blew oh, horn. I used to be with Cameo Parkway. Yeah, see, Buddy see that's Savitt. what I said to the people. This all began. What Kenny did, this was a transition from right. sound, from sound, from team, from Cameo to Parkway into Gamble, and then fully into national. So you still kept all those cats from the very beginning as a part of the family. We kept them together. It was like it was like a uh, it was like a herd. A herd. You got to keep the herd together, brother. Hey, listen, man. <laughs> we had a ball. But you know what? There's so many talented people mm -hmm. working together. Like when you mentioned uh, my man Vince, this is such a talented man. You know, one one uh, well, Vince was on all of our sessions because that was part of the sound was the vibes. Yeah. You know, and uh, you. You combine the vibes along with the guitar. And then, because the guitar was playing like West Montgomery octaves. And the, between the vibes and the guitar playing those octaves, that's where you get that sound from. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm, I'm going to give you another name, Don Ronaldo. Oh. Now, let me tell you. Let me, let me tell you. Kenny, who Don Ronaldo was. This cat was a percussionist, man. And he, I met him when I was 13 years old on Bob Horn's bandstand show. Was and Ronaldo then, down there? What's that? I'm sorry. I said, was Ronaldo down there? Uh, yes. Ronaldo was back with Bob Horn, man, and Matt Sigal. Oh, and, and when you got him as that percussionist, man, amazing. Man, Don him. Ronaldo was the... Uh, um, he played violin. Yep. And you know what? He was, we made him the band leader. He was band leader. Yep. For all, all of the, the, the um, sessions we did, Ronaldo was the coordinator for, the, for every, all the musicians because he took care of business. You know, I, I, I met him when he was doing percussion and playing violin back in 56, 57, Kenny Kenny. Wow, ain't that something? I mean, it's just it. Yeah, because, see, uh, Ronaldo, Don Ronaldo was, uh, uh, he played, he played the uh, violin. Yeah. Let then, me ask you, uh, Madeline Bell. Madeline Bell. I'm going to make you love me. Right, 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 right. She did tell, that. Tell me about that. Well, we didn't have a whole lot to do with that because she, she did, I'm going to make you love me. Right. That's what I'm saying. Madeline Bell. Yeah. And uh, after... Uh, Donna Ross and the Temptations did I'm Going to Make You Love Me. The first person that, that recorded I'm Going to Make You Love Me was Dee Dee Warwick, Dionne Warwick's sister. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And after that, I don't think it did too well. But what happened was is that uh, Madeline Bell picked that song up and did it over in England. After that, uh, Nick Ashford and Valerie Simpson was producing The Supremes and The Temptations and Nick Ashford took I'm Going to Make You Love Me and recorded it with the uh, uh, with the Temptations and the Supremes. Yeah, yeah. And I, I almost crashed in my car when I heard it on the radio. <laughs> hey, hey, Gita, let me tell you this. I was riding home one day, <clears throat> and uh, uh, I forget who it was. I think it was Jocko. One of them said, hey, we got a big one, and this is brand new, and this, that, and another is by the Temptations and the Supremes. And then... When they started singing, I'm going to make you love me. I said, wow. <laughs> Man, it's my Kenny, let me tell you something. I, this hour that we've spent together is so wonderful because it enlightens the audience of who this man is. He's devoted his life to music, and it began when he was a little kid, as he said, with the Romeos and hooking up with this writer, with, with Jerry Ross, and then Huff. And what they've created yeah. is international. And I want to thank you, Kenny Gamble. And I want to thank your beautiful wife, Fatima, and all that you have done for this industry. And I want you to keep on doing what you love to do, making people happy. Making them happy. Yeah, and, and you know, the other thing, too, is that what I'm really proud of and feel good about is how, how you can get into the community and do things in the community 
and and help because we get you know time goes by quick you know and uh, I'm really happy that you came in Jerry and that we could we could get together because we could go on and on and on we could go on for <laughs> another couple hours I could talk another hour about my main man Broadway Eddie Warhoffman oh Eddie Warhoffman and his father was in the bail bond business with my old man the Gimp <laughs> Gimp I come I come into my office. And here the Gimp and Sam Warhoffman is sitting in my office. I say, hey, what are you guys doing? Said, oh, we're going they were getting the guys out of jail. <laughs> I, I gave him some keys. I gave him keys to that uh, to our office. <laughs> Listen, Warhoffnick. I want you to have a wonderful holiday, a safe holiday. You know I love you. You are part of the fabric of Philadelphia. You are the history of Philadelphia. And God bless you, all right? Thank you, Keita, and thank all of you, too. Thank you, my man, Daniel, I think his name is. David, the Daniel Keita. My man. <laughs>